gonna turn it over to uh, John Whiston here soon. Um, John is the president of Inside Out's uh, board of directors and a retired attorney. Good evening, can you hear me? Is this working? Okay. Um, as Michelle said, my name is John Whiston. Um, I've been a volunteer at Inside Out. Um, louder, did somebody say louder? Okay, louder, oh, closer. Um, since its very beginning, I wanna just do a very brief um, introduction of the folks that are on the panel. My hope for the panel is that each of the speakers will talk for seven to 10 minutes, and that will give us time for panel discussion, questions and answers at, at the end of the hour. Um, at the far end um, is um, Sam Lam Langholtz here from the governor's office. We really appreciate uh, Sam taking his time away from all of his obligations in Des Moines. And I want to say I really appreciate my on my own as an individual, uh, Governor Kim Reynolds' um, commitment to uh, having everybody have a second chance. Uh, many of you may have noticed from the news on Tuesday, she uh, again, uh, made her commitment to second chances and to creating a uh, committee that would focus on uh, recommendations for felon disenfranchisement and for criminal justice uh, in general. Next to him is Mark Stringer from the ACLU of Iowa. Uh, next to Mark is Doran Walker, uh, a, an inside out participant um, and also a member of our corporate board of directors, a representative of the participants. And finally, on my immediate left is Professor Allison Gurney from the, Guernsey from the uh, um, Iowa, University of Iowa College of Law. Um, before I turn it over to our panel, I want to um, say a big shout out to uh, the staff, uh, Jamie and um, Rich and um, Michelle, um, and to all the participants and all the uh, volunteers who put this together. My wife Dorothy and I, we left for the mountains of Wyoming three months ago when this was just a glimmer uh, of subject of a meeting and we arrived back and it's this wonderful event. So uh, a big hand for all the staff and volunteers and participants. Uh, one of the very first things that came up when uh, Inside Out came into existence four years ago, we would have people coming back and we would be able to give them some help with finding employment or finding a place to live, uh, get them in touch with substance abuse, uh, give them a community uh, to work with. And, and over and over again, somebody would say, you're a lawyer, how do I get my voting rights back? Um, so we started putting some effort into that. Um, we were very fortunate last year we had Dan Tolman. Dan, are you here? We're, uh, he's back there being shy. Um, helped a lot of our participants go through a very unwieldy process at the governor's office. Um, we also uh, got very involved in advocating publicly uh, for changes in how the law treats this problem with a uh, felon disenfranchisement. So we went out and uh, bought a whole bunch of t-shirts to advocate for changes in that law. And then all of a sudden it sounded like that the Constitution was going to be amended and we were going to get stuck with all those t-shirts. <laughs> I'm pleased to report they're still available over at the table right here. Um, they're going to be timely for at least the next six months. So uh, before you leave, you might look at one of those uh, um, t-shirts. So let me turn it first to Sam Langholtz, um, who graduated from the University of Iowa College of Law, um, held a lot of uh, responsible positions in state government in uh, Des Moines, and is now the special counsel and senior advisor to Kim Reynolds, and I'd ask uh, Sam to give us a little background, a little context, a little overview of how the system has worked, is working right now, and what he sees as the future for the 
felon disenfranchisement legally. Sure. Well, and uh, I'm happy in in questions to come back and fill in, you know, what what I leave out. I want to, um, but before I start, also uh, express uh, my great appreciation uh, for the the invitation to be here. I really appreciate the opportunity. The governor appreciates the opportunity to be uh, talking about this issue that she cares about uh, very much, and it's uh, been an honor to to be a part of the process and the discussion and trying to work through. Um, uh, as we will hopefully be successful in amending the Iowa Constitution. And I want to focus, you know, like the governor's focus, I, I want to focus sort of on uh, the, the path forward, but just to remind folks um, kind of why we're here, it's because the Iowa Constitution um, says that if you have been uh, convicted of a felony or judged uh, incompetent, um, uh, to, to vote, uh, you do not have the right, the, your right to vote is taken away in the Iowa Constitution. Um, and over the years, you know, um, you know the various um, tax by the governor, you know, have been, um, been endeavored to, you know, deal with the fact that, that the Constitution is there. Generally speaking, um, uh, the main way that you get your right to vote is by re sending in an application to the governor um, asking for that right to be restored using the governor's clemency power. Um, when Governor Reynolds came in, um, there was a pretty complicated process uh, to be applying. Um, she has made several different attempts at trying to uh, simplify that process, um, but she's not happy with it. We're not happy with it. Uh, we devote a lot of time in the governor's office and resources to uh, reviewing those applications. Um, even more just in the last, um, you know, the last several, you know, the last year that this has been uh, higher attention um, uh, which is a good thing. Um, I think you know the, the governor has now granted, uh, restored the rights of. Um, I think it, it changes daily, but I think we're up to uh, about 240 uh, individuals, which is actually more than Governor Branstead restored during his entire, not his full tenure in governor, but in the last seven years um, that that he was there, he restored you know 200. Um, uh, rights, um, but that takes a lot of staff time on our part. It takes a lot of time within other parts of uh, state government. Um, when those applications come in, uh, they get uh, we turn them over to uh, the Division of Criminal Investigation and do a background check, a very limited background check, just to verify the information on the the application and make sure that in fact um, the the individual is. Um, uh, has completed their sentence, is no longer on probation or parole. Um, just a, a, a few things we're checking, but nonetheless, it's still pretty time consuming to, to go through. And um, really, in the lead up to the 2018 uh, election, um, you know, the governor felt very strongly to, that we needed to make sure that individuals who were who had submitted applications, had their rights back um, in time and in, in, in time to vote in the 2018 election. And so we, because of that election pending, we spent some more time focusing um, on it. And um, you know, in fact, in the lead up to the election, we were you know, kind of racing against the clock because you know, as you know, there began to be some press stories about, um, about it, which caused more people to be applying. Um, and we wanted, again, our goal was any application in our hands, you know, would be granted. Um, and in the course of getting those granted so quickly, we started doing something that had not been done um, in the past, which was calling people um, to tell them that their, their rights had been restored because going through the normal mail process you know, wasn't even going to necessarily let them know um, that uh, they had their right. And we were you know, emailing them their you know, restoration certificate so they could take it into a poll worker um, who would say, well, you can't vote. You know, you're, you're here you know, on a list and say, no, I, I, I can. Um, and in the course, of those, you know, the, the ripple effects of all those sorts of things, um, soon people started coming up to the governor um, when she was out at you know, events and sporting events, you know, and after the election and saying, you know, your office, you know, restored my rights. They, they called me to, to, to tell me that. Um, and that was one of the most meaningful things, you know, that, that's happened to me. Our staff that were talking to people and sharing this information, it was one of sort of, you know, uh, the, the joys of the job. There aren't a lot of joys, you know, always in the governor's office. You're often sharing, you know, bad news. And this was sharing really good news. And, um, and, and yet the governor, so, so the governor was 
excited by this, but also frustrated by the fact that um, um, that it was taking uh, all of this process uh, to, to, to do that. Uh, second chances are important to her. She understands uh, from her own involvement in the criminal justice system that people should not be judged by their worst day. Um, and she understands um, and came to understand in these, these conversations um, uh, with, uh, with people who had their rights restored. And I should add as well, you know, we started, uh, we, she started hearing about how much fun we were having making these calls that she said, oh, you know, could I call? Call some of these people too, and and so she she had you know uh, unfortunately as the numbers have gotten up, um, she hasn't been able to call everyone, but she's had some amazing conversations with people as she's called. Um, you know, once they get over the shock, you know, I, you know who, who's who's calling? You mean you know the the, the governor of Iowa is calling? Um, uh, she's had some great conversations um, you know with them about how um, how meaningful it is to them uh, to. Uh, to, to, to get their rights back, um, and you know, she thinks about it from a from a public space safety you know perspective as well. You know, we want to invite people back into the community once they have served uh, uh, served their time, and we don't want to be ostracizing people and having you know uh, you know uh, making them second class citizens. Um, you know, from a public safety perspective, she believes that this is something that will help um, you know reintegrate uh, folks back into society, not recidivate, um, and you know, um, as they've discharged their sentence, um, you know, c come back and get their voting rights uh, back. So um, as she, you know, tasked us with thinking about, well, what can we do about this? Um, you know, uh, we came back, um, you know, with the recommendation, well, really, the only way to, to really fix this problem is with a constitutional amendment. Um, and uh, after spending some further time digging into it and thinking about it and thinking through various options uh, of that, she surprised a lot of people last year in the condition of the state. There were audible gasps in the House mm -hmm. chamber um, as she uh, you know, shared and proposed uh, that uh, uh, Iowa should begin the process of uh, amending its constitution. Uh, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, depending on your perspective of you know, how constitution should be changed, Iowa has a pretty um, extensive, complicated constitutional amendment process as well. Uh, constitutional amendment has to pass both houses of the legislature twice with an election intervening um, and as we discovered um, you know this last time you know with publication to uh, uh, to the world uh, a, as well in that in that time frame so it's a lengthy process uh, but one that the governor's committed to one that uh, she believes is the really the, the way to address uh, this issue we were thrilled um, uh, to have uh, her proposed constitutional amendment pass the Iowa House of Representatives uh, with only two members uh, of the House of Representatives uh, voting against it. Um, and uh, you know, we are continuing, will be, have been continuing, and will continue to work uh, to get that across the finish line as well uh, in the Iowa Senate. Um, there's a lot of support uh, for it there, but there's also, um, you know, understandably, you know, um, legislators take their responsibility of uh, considering constitutional amendments seriously and have some uh, concerns about, you know, want to, um, I think, are continuing to deliberate, and I. I um, I believe we will get it across the finish line. Uh, again, because of our the lengthy amendment process, uh, uh, the fact that it did not pass both chambers last session, we are in the middle of our two-year legislative session right now. Um, uh, you know, doesn't affect the ultimate timetable. If it passes uh, this spring, um, it will then need to pass once more after the uh, 2020 elections. Um, and after that, uh, it can go on the ballot um, as soon as the legislature would decide it wants to, uh, um, the legislature would decide precisely what election uh, it, it would go on. So it's, it's not that far away, um, actually, and the governor, you know, um, remains focused on fixing the issue in that way. Um, and I think that's all, all I'll say for now. But again, I, as we get to questions, I'd be happy to talk further about how our current process works or about the amendment or any other uh, uh, questions folks have. Uh, as the moderator, I'm going to invoke my powers. I said there would be questions later. I have a question now. Sure. Uh, so the statistics I see that there are somewhere between 40 and 50,000 people in Iowa, which would mean something on the order of 2,000 to 2,500 people in Johnson County um, that are eligible for the process that you have expedited. Uh, and I want to thank you for that. Um, 
as I understood what you said is that you don't become eligible for that process until you've discharged parole. Is that right? That's correct. Yes. Okay. Um, I know that there are some people who are convicted of sex offenses that end up with what's called a special sentence, which puts them on lifetime parole. Does that mean that they're never going to be able to vote? Uh, it does currently, yes. Okay. That's a yeah. You know, it, it's an issue we've we you know we've been um, we were actually just uh, looking at it recently internally. We had some applications uh, applications like that. Uh, there are a few um, actually you know a lifetime sentence. You know I think is the uh, the statutory you know it, a, a lifetime special sentence mm -hmm. and uh, with that definition. Um, it uh, you know the sentence hasn't been discharged so okay. um, and that would also um, I, I should distinguish between we we consider the sex offender registry irrelevant so that that is not anything that that is factored in as uh, uh, as we look at look at things or that would be in the proposed constitutional amendment language okay thank you Sam um, questions. <laughs> Let's let's give our panel a chance. Maybe they will resolve them, and I will. Um, I set a bad example. I'm really sorry. <laughs> um, our next speaker is uh, Professor Allison Guernsey, also a, um, a graduate of the University of Iowa College of Law. Um, when she graduated from the law school, um, Sam went west to Des Moines. Um, uh, Allison went all the way to Washington State, where she was a federal public defender in eastern Washington and Idaho. Uh, she now uh, runs the federal criminal defense uh, clinic at the law school and is running the uh, voter um, What's Vot vo the voter registration clinic, and you may have s passed several of her uh, students, and I'm going to ask her to talk a little bit about her experience and her students' experience helping people through the process. Yes, yeah, so, so as uh, Sam talked about, the, the law in Iowa is that if you've been convicted of an infamous crime, and that's been loosely defined as being a felony, right, you're disenfranchised. But the law in Iowa about whether or not you can get your right back is actually quite confusing. It's a series of interlocking questions that you have to ask about the individual sentence. So the first question, as we were just chatting about, is when you completed your sentence. So when were you not only released from custody, but then also released from any community custody obligation you had, like probation or supervised release or parole? Another question that you have to ask in determining whether or not your rights have been restored is whether or not you have any outstanding legal financial obligations. So do you have court fines or fees or restitution outstanding? And then a third issue you have to consider in determining whether or not um, your rights in Iowa have been restored is um, where your conviction actually occurred. Is it an Iowa state conviction? Is it a federal conviction in Iowa? Is it a federal conviction in another state? Are you living in Iowa but have another state's conviction outside of the state of Iowa? So there are all of these things that create, a, I think, quite a difficult path for people to determine whether um, their rights have been restored. But the biggest thing that makes it really difficult is the sentence completion date. And so, and what happened is, is there are three dates that are really important for individuals who have completed their sentence. The first is, if you completed your sentence before July 4th of 2005, then your voting rights were automatically restored. If you completed your sentence um, before January 14th, 2011, then it's likely that your voting rights were automatically restored, but you actually have to check a list that the Iowa uh, state government keeps. And then the third salient date that you have to remember is everyone who completes their sentence after January 14th of 2011 has to go through the application process. And that's the process that Sam was recently talking about with the governor's office. So needless to say, it's not an easy answer for a lot of people, particularly non-lawyers. You would think, can I vote, would be an easy yes or no. And it's not. And so when I came to Iowa, I have a wonderful colleague at the, at the law school named Daria Fisher-Page, and she runs a transactional-based clinic. And the two of us got together and really saw that the Iowa law 
was really complicated and that we were fielding questions from people who found out what we did about their ability to restore their voting rights. And it turned out that people really weren't availing themselves of all of the resources available. So in order to hopefully clarify what the Iowa law is for people who are attempting to discern, am I able to vote or can I seek restoration of my right to vote, uh, we founded the Voting Rights Restoration Clinic. And the clinic is essentially an amalgamation of both my Federal Criminal Defense Clinic and Professor Fisher Page's Community Empowerment Law Project Clinic, where we have our students go and do these pop-up clinics where they have people come and people can inquire as to, can I vote? If I can't vote, what do I need to do to vote? And then we'll help them and walk them through the process. And so I think in the lifetime of the clinic, which has been only since October of 2018, we've represented now over 90 individuals in the voting rights restoration process, some of whom we have filed applications with the governor's office, but many of them, our representations really consist of just clarifying their status under Iowa law. Right? And one of the things that's been so striking to me is the number of people we see who have had their right to vote for many, many years and who are operating under the assumption that they, in fact, weren't eligible to vote. And that's because the law is really complicated and those voting dates that I talked about as to when you can vote are set forth in various executive orders. And so what um, Sam was talking about is the governor's priority being changing the Constitution, right, so that there's not these overlaying different laws that dictate if someone can vote, but rather a blanket statement as whatever they decide the statement would be in the constitutional amendment, right, you can vote. Um, after you've completed your sentence, or perhaps in an ideal world, it would say that voting rights are not actually tied to criminal um, offenses at all. Um, so in any event, though, that's what my students do. Uh, my students work with all these individuals in Iowa and consult with them on how it is we can get them participating um, in the, the political process and in exercising a fundamental right that they, that they have or that they may not have but can actually apply to get back. Thank you, Allison. No questions. Uh, <laughs> can, can I actually, can I add a and, and this is going, I, and I meant to say this because I think it is important to articulate. Um, so the data that I have seen is that there are about 52,000 people in the state of Iowa who um, are disenfranchised at this moment. And I think it's important to highlight one of the reasons why this should be really concerning to everyone who's involved in um, diversity, equity, and inclusion issues is that it's 2.1% of the statewide voting age that's disenfranchised, but that actually accounts for 10% of the adult black voting age, right? So these voter disenfranchisement constitutional provisions and laws that we see across the nation were originally designed to disenfranchise minority voters. And even if that's not their current purpose, right, they essentially operate that way in effect. Right. So this is an important issue that we should all be concerned about, not just because we want people to participate in democracy, but that we want everybody to participate or have the opportunity to participate equally. So sorry about that, but I just felt the need. Uh, th that was my question. Oh, perfect. <laughs> uh, um, our, ne our next speaker is Doran Walker, uh, who's a returned citizen, uh, of, had been a uh, stalwart, stalwart uh, inside out volunteer for years and, and was chosen by the participants to be their representative on our corporate board. He also has, in the last several years, been going to uh, institutions throughout the state as far as Clorinda, right? Did you go to Clorinda? Clorinda, Newton, IMCC, okay. and Mount Pleasant. Talking with inmates about how they can best prepare for their reentry into society. Uh, thank you uh, for being here tonight. How many of you folks pay taxes? All right. Uh, I promised that I wasn't going to come here and be hard to get along with. I'm not arguing with anybody or anything. Um, I think it's very important as a person that served 13 years and eight months in prison for crimes that I chose to do. I take full responsibility of that uh, for my actions and for everything I did. Um, I don't think it's fair that you folks have to pay the bill to warehouse individuals. Um, a very nice slideshow. 
very nice stuff from the governor's office. Uh, it's all about money and, and what a waste of tax dollars. Um, so uh, I met the requirements to get my voting rights restored. Um, actually, Dan Tallman in the back actually helped me from uh, inside out. I had a friend that was uh, very helpful for me uh, when I left incarceration. Unlike most people, um, I was given a chance um, from a ministry. Um, I left prison with a with shelter, which is, is a huge thing, and a job. Um, I still work for that same job. Uh, a small company in Kelowna took a chance on me. Um, my boss says he'd hire 10 more guys if he could fire me, like if we could find him for him. <laughs> that meets the requirements, just like the voting rights. So uh, Dan asked um, at one of our community meetings that we have every Thursday night at Inside Out if anybody was met the requirements, if they would be interested in having their rights restored. It was under the last um, form, if you will. Uh, which was very confusing. A friend of mine that helped me a lot upon my release that had also been incarcerated had got this form offline and attempted to negotiate through it himself, got frustrated and threw it in a drawer. Um, so when Dan asked, I said, yeah, I'll do it. And I have a friend that would really do it too. So we actually went through the process together at the same time and um, each paid uh, $15 for a DCI background check, signed some papers. Dan did the stuff for us pretty much because it's very confusing. And it was sent to the governor's office. Um, we had hoped to vote in the last election, and I think we submitted it middle October, and it was wishful thinking. But uh, my friend Todd, that uh, he couldn't be here tonight because he owns his own business and he's out of town. Um, He's very persistent when he starts something. And he said, you know, I'm gonna call the governor's office. We're gonna find out where this is at. And so he called and he didn't like the answers. And he said, I think you should call and, <laughs> and, and find out. And I'm like, well, they already just told you, you know, why do, why do I need to call? And he said, that's how it works. And I'm like, well, <laughs> I, I don't wanna be that guy, you know? So, um, cause he didn't like the answers he got. And so after some encouragement, I called and well, they said, oh, yeah, we have, we have your, your application, you know. I said, well, can you tell me what's going on with it? And they said, we can tell you it's a DCI for their review. And I said, well, I just paid 15 bucks to get their report. Why is there? It's very complicated, sir. And I said, well, I'm, I'm figuring this out, you know. <laughs> um, and then I asked if there was any idea when we might get it. <clears throat> Again, they stated it's a very complicated process. I said, I'm, I'm figuring it out. So we were contacted by a local newspaper that asked if we would do an interview and tell our story. And so I, did, I just like to live a quiet, calm life out in Kelowna with the Mennonites and, and just, <laughs> just, just eat donuts, you know. Um, uh, but I, I agreed. And after some encouragements with some friends, it said, if, if, if we don't, tell people and, and try to educate taxpayers and I, I'm so glad that the students are here. I see you as our future and the people who will be making the laws when I'm old. I, I appreciate you coming tonight. Um, so we did an interview for a newspaper. They asked if I knew anybody else. I gave him my friend Todd's uh, information. Uh, they contacted him. We thought a uh, big deal. We're just going to get our names in the paper again. Only this time, I'm not wearing handcuffs. So um, the paper was released that morning, that night around five o'clock. I was at Inside Out for a community meeting. My phone rings. I'm like, who is this? And I, I answer it. It's the governor's office. <laughs> they had <laughs> restored my voting rights that day. Um, <laughs> Coincidence? I mean, you know, <laughs> I bought a lottery ticket and I didn't win that night. So, um, uh, and the reason it's so important to me, like I say, um, I feel very um, drawn, and I feel that 
it's my responsibility. Thank you, um, Warden, for allowing prisoners that meet the criteria to go back uh, to the prison. While I was incarcerated, uh, the only people that we really had much interaction with um, were individuals, and I don't know if it's wouldn't or couldn't follow the rule. I, I, I don't know. Um, it, it's complicated. I mean, I had a brother that was incarcerated and had to go back several times. Um, I thought the system worked and the halfway house helped people. It's, it's very complicated for people that haven't actually uh, been through it. Um, so three months after I was out, uh, the Oakdale Choir was having a concert, and uh, Mike the Cervantes, the director at the uh, uh, Inside Out at the time, said, hey, I think you should go to this. I said, they're not going to let me go. I just got out of prison. They have rules. It's a few years, you know. He said, well, I think you should try it. And uh, much to my surprise, I was approved to go. And um, that started a whole different chain of events for me where I could go back and tell people I knew there. I know people in every prison in the state. And I can go there and tell them, listen, if I can do it, you can. All, all this bunk we heard about, there's so many people out there to gig and everything, they are giving jobs away in Iowa right now. If you can't get a job, it's because we can't make it work. Uh, I mean, there are incredible jobs. So to be able to go back and, and tell my friends, um, and, I, and I work you know, with Inside Out um, and Living Beyond the Bars, too. Um, we do reentry workshops at some of the prisons, and uh, we just go there with this reentry guide. Uh, very helpful piece of uh, a document. Um, doesn't talk about voter rights though, so. Um, but but I am thankful I have them, and it's just one more thing that I could go back and tell the men. Listen, if I can do all of this, anybody can. Uh, I'm just I'm just a person that survived the system, and uh, I pay taxes like everybody else, and I do the best I can to be a productive member of society. Thank you, thank you, Doran. Um, you ended up talking about taxes, and th that reminds me that um, there are five, 5,500 people who are on parole with the Iowa Department of Corrections. Um, and so that works for about 250 people in Johnson County. Those are people who are out there working, and uh, paying taxes, yet they're not allowed to elect their representation. It's taxation without representation. Now, some of those periods of parole are short, um, but some of them are lifelong, as we talked about earlier. Some of them can be as long as 20 years. I was talking to an Inside Out participant just yesterday that his uh, eligibility to get his civil rights restored is 2038. All, that's 20 years of taxation without representation. Okay, we can save that for discussion. All right, our final speaker is Mark Stringer. He's the executive director of the Iowa ACLU, uh, and the ACLU has been in the lead of taking the cases on these uh, felon disenfranchisement cases, um, winning some and losing some. Uh, before he came to the ACLU two and a half years ago, Mark was the uh, executive pastor uh, at uh, the Unitarian Church in Des Moines and very involved in all kinds of human rights, particularly gay marriage in the central Iowa area. And I've asked him to give his perspective, ACLU's perspective, on where we go from now. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to speak uh, tonight. The ACLU works in three primary ways, some of you may know. We work through litigation, so we work in the courts. We work through legislation and policy work, so at the state house and in local governments. And then we work in public education and advocacy. And I think our work on uh, felony disenfranchisement has fallen into each of those three uh, areas of our work. Litigation uh, for uh, a good chunk of time, about four or five years ago, uh, we were part of a, uh, the Chido case, uh, which basically was the case that led the 
uh, to misdemeanors not not being disenfranchising. Is that the right way to say that? <laughs> uh, so, so it used to be that misdemeanors, if you were in jail for more than a year, you would lose your right to vote. Uh, and then in 2016, we had a case on behalf of a client uh, who, uh, in 2008, her attorney had told her that when she got out, uh, finished her, completed her sentence, uh, that she would have her right to vote restored because that was in the time when the Governor Vilsack's uh, executive order was still in place. And that was the right information at the time, but by the time she got out, there had been an executive order from Governor Branstad that had rescinded that right, and she didn't know it. She took her kids to vote to teach them that this is important, and she got in trouble and was arrested, basically, because the Secretary of State at the time was on this uh, hunt to try to ferret out voting fraud. And so they went after her. Uh, so that went into the courts, and the jury uh, basically said, well, you're not guilty of anything after 40 minutes of deliberation. But then that, that case rose to the Supreme Court to try to determine what should a non-violent non felony like hers uh, make you lose your right to vote. And the Supreme Court did not rule in the favor of uh, ending felony disenfranchisement for that level of felony. So uh, that led us, along with a bunch of partners, to create an effort uh, in 2016 to get this constitutional amendment going. Uh, there are about at least 17 partners that we've worked with uh, on that. There's a website that we have uh, that's one word, Restore Votes Iowa. Uh, if you Google that, you'll get to our website that gives you some of the background, all of our partners, uh, including Inside Out. Uh, and um, so we were, of course, delighted that the governor uh, made this a priority because uh, it's something that we've cared about for a very long time and uh, just uh, are grateful for her leadership on this. I mean, think about it. How many times do you hear of an elected official who basically gives up their power or tries to give up their power? That's essentially what she's doing. She's saying the governor really shouldn't be in charge of determining who has the right to vote or not. So uh, we're certainly supportive of, of her effort and we'll continue to work uh, to get this across the finish line as I know the governor wants. Uh, and so as Sam said, you know, we've gotten quite, a, quite far in the first year since she made this a priority. Uh, went, got through the House uh, and it got through uh, the first uh, subcommittee of the Senate. And then it, it kind of stalled out, but not, I don't think it's because people don't necessarily want it. Uh, the senators, it's just that the, it, there weren't the votes yet. I, I think there's, as, as it was pointed out, there's, there needs to be some understanding what does this mean. Uh, our position, the ACLU's position, is that just pass the clean House joint resolution. Don't try to muck with it. We've still got to get, get it through a whole other General Assembly anyway. As Sam said, it's got to get through this spring, and if it passes clean, then, then it will go to the next General Assembly. And then there can be further conversations. There's a lot of things to consider. Now, of course, the ACLU of Iowa is of the mind, kind of like Allison said, that you really should never lose your right to vote. Um, but, but that's not where we are right now. And we want to work with what's on the table. And we want to uh, try to get that across the finish line. Um, because we've got broad bipartisan support. I mean, there are uh, strange partners involved in this, everything from the Koch Brothers, Americans for Prosperity, to the Family Leader, to the ACLU of Iowa. These three groups never are on the same page. <laughs> but on this one, we are. And uh, you know, ACLU of Iowa is always about civil liberties and civil rights, no matter who's advocating for them. Uh, we protect everybody's rights, or try to, and we work with anyone who wants to do that. So we're, we're grateful for the progress that's been made and hopeful for the, for the next steps. Happy to open it up to okay. questions. Th thank you, Mark. Um, before I open up to questions, um, it, it, does anybody on the panel have something they'd like to say in response to something? I, f I forgot when I went to register in the county I live in after getting my rights restored. If you read on the bottom, the penalty for voting, if, if you're not supposed to, is up to five years imprisonment and a $10,000 fine. I found that pretty startling. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? Okay. I mean, I, I think hearing questions from people okay. who are not yeah. us. Yeah. yeah uh, can somebody just explain to me the theoretic theoretical danger to the state of Iowa if someone who was 18 years old and walking around on the streets, a free person mostly, and uh, having a job and paying taxes, 
If, if, what's the danger if that person votes? How does the state, what should we be afraid of? Well, I think the answer to that is, is from my perspective, very easy, and that's nothing. Um, well, what's the, what somebody is saying that there's a danger. What are they saying? Right. I, I mean, I, I, I think historically the justification for that has not been so much that they're a danger, but that because this individual committed a crime against society, they should have some sort of punishment that extends just beyond the period of incarceration, a period of time. Sort of an add-on. Sort. I'm sorry. Or forever, that's right. There are people who are disenfranchised forever, that's right. But I think the idea being, right, that this person in some, ha some way has done something that they are not deserving yet to be awarded the full benefits of citizenship. Can't we just make them put a scarlet letter on their <laughs> clothes? I mean. Um, actually, the Iowa Supreme Court has had something to say al along those lines in the Chiodo, Chiodo um, case that uh, Mark mentioned. It said that the reason for disenfranchisement is not punishment. It can't be punishment, really. Um, that the, the only constitutional rationale for the disenfranchisement is to protect the integrity of the voting process. So that means that the people in the legislature who are not convinced that these people have been, quote, punished enough, are setting themselves up for a big time constitutional challenge. So my question is, we've had 240 about people have their rights restored by our governor. We have 55, 50-ish thousand people who are disenfranchised. That's kind of a big gap. And I'm just wondering if you have an idea, well, how many people have applied? I guess that would be a really important number to know. How many people have applied, and why isn't that number bigger? That's an interesting question, and um, so I, I don't have the you know the full application numbers you know off the top of my head. Um, generally speaking, the governor, this governor, and I think Governor Branstead was pretty similar. You know, did not deny requests. Sometimes they would return them and say, you know, "Say um, you know, you you have not." completed your sentence, you have not, um, uh, uh, you have, you you have not yet fulfilled certain requirements, you didn't complete the application at all, those sorts of things. The one kind of potential exception is this sentence that would never end, um, you know, that, that's a challenging one. I mean, I think that's probably a denial. Um, but other than that, you know, there are not people that have been applying that have been, you know, permanently told no. Um, you know, we've tried to go back and look. You know, we talked about the executive order time frames and when there were, you know, the 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 blanket um, granting of rights pre um, pre Vilsack order, and then the period where it was automatic. And interest, you know, trying to understand kind of what effects those had. Um, interestingly, at least from our data research, we didn't. It, it didn't look like there were huge numbers of new people voting even then. And I don't know what to make of that. There, there were not. There were not jumps in voter registration. Um, there weren't huge jumps, even you know, party difference. You know, when when that happened, um, there were not big changes in turnout. Um, and you would think. Um, you know, there were a significant number of people that just got their rights. You know, anyone who had been, you know, convicted of a, uh, an infamous crime, um, you know, from, you know, who was alive up until the point, you know, of, you know, the mid-2000s. Um, and so I, I, don't, I don't have an answer for why that is and why there aren't, you know, whether that is, um, you know, coming from people not, you know, not realizing it, you know, even as much sort of as attention as that got when it happened, people not realizing, um, you know, it, it struck me when Allison was talking about, um, you know, informing people about how they actually could have vote. You know, the, the most heartbreak, I was, was just talking to uh, my deputy legal counsel, Michael uh, Bowl, who is, you know, often in doing most of this, this contact, he we was just sharing a couple days ago how the most heartbreaking letters for us to write are the ones where we say, we're returning your application to you because you didn't need this um, and you've got the right to vote. I mean, that, that just, it, it aches when you uh, write one of those. And so I don't know how much of that 
you know, it, it, it is the issue. And uh, um, but uh, we do have, you know, a, a pretty significant number, you know, pending at the moment. Again, since um, we revised the application process, we've seen a tremendous uptick in uh, uh, the volume of of people um, up applying, and so uh, you know. There's a number pending at DCI right now, and we're trying to figure out. You know, we um, one of the things that was changed in that application was taking out the the payment for a DCI background check, um, uh, and uh, so I, I don't know if that's part of what allowed more to more to come, or just the public attention uh, to the issue over the last couple of months. But can you give um, us some idea of what the pretty significant number pending is? Just some idea. Uh, 100 or 200, I think. Okay, so we're talking a total Not thousands. I mean, we're not, not talking thousands. about, you know, you know the 50,000 sitting out there. But there are, you know, okay. uh, in the last couple of months, yes, there, there's there's several, you know, a, a lot that have come. But I, I don't know where, um, um, why there's a bigger discrepancy. I, if I can just say two points. I mean, I obviously haven't done a study on this. But two things that we see quite frequently in the voting rights restoration clinics that we do, and we've done six now over the past, seven now over the past um, year and a bit. And one thing goes back to what Sam and I have both mentioned, which is just education, right? The, the d difference between the people who aren't voting and who are eligible to vote, they just don't know it, and so they're not getting out to the polls. But the other thing, too, is a desire to vote. So we piggyback our voting rights restoration clinics on Iowa Legal Aid's expungement clinics. And so we'll be talking to people who are eligible to have their rights restored, and we're happy to walk them through the process. But they are so sour on participating mm -hmm. in government that they're choosing not to. And that's a choice, right? Like that's, mm -hmm. their, that's their speech. And so one of the things that I think um, we need to do is just be better about encouraging people to be participants in our society generally so that they feel that they do actually have a voice and that getting their rights back is a valuable thing. Well, I, I should tell you, I'm leading the League of Women Voters effort on re-enfranchisement, and I would just like to urge everyone to vote and take a friend. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thank you uh, for coming here this evening, all of you. Um, I, I would just like to say that in January of 2011, it was very heartbreaking that when Governor Branstad came into office, and I think he rescinded Executive Order 72, and what that was was a process that automatically reinstated thousands upon thousands of citizenship rights for convicted felons, um, and at that time there were also aggravated misdemeanors that were being that had lost their rights, and so this was an automated process that was started by Governor Vilsack and continued through Chet Culver. And I think it's well established that the, 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 the prerogative to, re, uh, to, to reestablish an, uh, citizenship rights is with, exclusively with the governor's office. And this process had worked so well. And it was such a, a positive and powerful thing. And it's just bewildering that the governor's office isn't willing to use that executive privilege right now to reinstate an executive order that would reinstate an automatic process for reinstatement of, of parolees, probationers, and those other individuals that discharged their sentence. And it, it worked well before. In 60 days, there was a determination. And we had thousands and thousands of, of felons were getting their rights reinstated. Compared to 240 right now, that's kind of, it still is kind of discouraging. And I was wondering, is, is, is there any vision in the future for the governor to use the power in this way, to, to reinstate an executive order that does this similar thing? Thank you for those comments and the, and the question. Um, you know, it, it's certainly something that, that we've spent time talking about and thinking about uh, internally. As I said, um, originally, the governor is focused on a constitutional amendment and really feels that that's where her energy and effort needs to be uh, focused to make a permanent solution um, here. And uh, to um, there are conservatives within the legislature that we're bringing along in getting support for a constitutional amendment because they believe they have they have constitutional concerns about going about the executive order route you know with it and appreciate the fact that the governor is trying to do this the right way in a con you know in from their perspective and in in going through a, a constitutional amendment you know process um, 
also, you know, I mean, as we've looked at it, um, you know, the, the, the executive order didn't actually work that well. I mean, there, there are issues with it. I mean, certainly it do, did get a lot of people um, through the process. Um, but, you know, some of, the, some of the, the cases that have come up and confusions of people, you know, voting when they, um, you know, when they weren't actually eligible to vote was because there's a lot of misperception that's, that that executive order meant that the constitutional provision wasn't there anymore and you, you could vote. And that's not the way it worked. It did um, uh, wipe out the past um, uh, the the reenfranchised anyone who had a, a a sentence that had discharged before uh, the executive order date, but on a and on a going forward basis, um, it set up a a mech, you know sort of a mail merge type mechanism of trying to uh, collect data uh, from the Department of Corrections and you know create these things. One of the things that did is if you didn't have a mailing address with the Department of Corrections, you didn't get your vote restored. A lot of people didn't know that, um, and uh, also. So there is no process to get people um, with, from federal convictions, out of state, out of state convictions, others that were, were coming on. And again, confusion that came from that. There's not a lot of, I mean, we've tried to think creatively about, you know, how can you, you know, you know what are ways that you could go about trying to, to do that in a way that actually would be, you know, administratively, um, uh, administratively better, and we'll continue, you know, sort of thinking about those things. But our, our energy and our focus really is trying to come up with a permanent solution through a constitutional amendment. So there's no there's no stopgap executive order plan that could shore this up until that that may happen 10, 20 years from now. We don't know. Well, the governor doesn't intend for it to take 10 or 20 years. Uh, you know, we hope that uh, uh, this will be moving forward this session, and again, um, you know, in 20. 21 and then uh, hopefully it will be uh, to the voters and you know that that's not that far away um, and she's not you know, I, 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 she hasn't ruled out anything as you know a, a potential thing this isn't you know a potent you know a, at some point in the future um, but um, you know she, she does also doesn't want to do anything that you know jeopardizes the the momentum that's building on uh, going through the, the constitutional process thank you I think you called the constitutional amendment proposal a clean. What does clean mean? What what's actually included? Well, I'm I'm I used to be a minister. I'm not an attorney and I'm not a lobbyist. I mean, I registered as one because I have to be. But I'm, <laughs> but I, I'm I, I I can say what I know unless you want to do it. But basically, if it, the, if the language changes in the Senate version, then it has to go back to the House, and then it, it gets com more complicated. So let's just pass what the House passed. That's what we're recommending and supporting. Pass what the House passed, and then we can go at it again the next So time. what did the House pass? So what the amendment does is it, uh, first of all, um, uh, and it, First of all, changes infamous crime to felony to get rid of the the ambiguity in, in issues surrounding um, surrounding that. Um, so it says, you know, if the amendment were passed, um, a, a individual would lose would, would be ineligible to vote if they're convicted of a felony uh, until they have uh, unless they're sent they have discharge their sentence. And it's actually only a few words, and I should have it memorized at this point, but so I kinda, I've kind of bungled it. But uh, So it's relatively, it is relatively clean. It, it allows, um, you know, there's, there's not a lot of other explanation. So in the legislative process, some of the issues that have come up and topics of discussion have been, um, you know, should, it, should this apply, should the automatic, um, should should the automatic restoration uh, apply to every criminal offense? Or are there some offenses that are so significant um, that there should that the that restoration should should not apply? There's also been a lot of discussion about restitution, fines, and court debt, and somehow you know should those things um, be incorporated in? And so there, there's been discussions both about whether the amendment, the constitutional amendment, should be amended in some way to address any of those issues, um, or whether whether there should be corresponding, um, you know, statutory implementation language that would address uh, some of those those language, because there is room um, for a statute on the topic uh, as well, because um, you know it 
the, the amendment would provide, you know, upon the discharge of sentence and what discharge of sentence means for any particular crime, you know, as a matter for legislative authority. So um, those are kind of, um, uh, you know, th there hasn't been a lot of discussion about changing the amendment language. I mean, I'm optimistic that in pretty close to the current form, you know, is, is what will ultimately be successful, but we're engaged in a lot of discussions with both chambers to, to figure that out. And just as a practical matter, because, you know, if, if, if it passes in the identical form to the House, moves on, um, you know, if it's amended again, you know, even just to, you know, ad address something, you know, a, a technical sort of thing, it will go back to the House. Um, you know, I, I don't think, you know, the, the governor, given the lengthy process and the importance of the constitutional amendment, you do want to get it right. So I don't know that we view bouncing back to the House as a very significant problem, you know, you know either if it, if it is necessary, if, if, if someone addresses a significant issue that, you know, needs to be uh, done, you know, it had overwhelming support in the House, and I don't expect that will, will change. Uh, so at this point, it would allow reenfranchisement for all crimes unless the legislature later excluded some? Correct. I mean, as written right now, that is correct. Um, you know, for it would, it, for, uh, it would say that you lose your right if you're convicted of a felony uh, until you discharge your sentence. And that includes um, parole? Uh, that it, so, so there is nothing that says in statute exactly what that is right now. Um, it, hap it is our office's interpretation that that would be current law, um, you know, that you know, your sentence is discharged upon the conclusion of probation and parole. I suspect no matter what, there will be some sort of implementation statute um, that clarifies these things. I think there is um, uh, a lot of interest in the legislature in, in avoiding a huge court fight about what the amendment means, like what's going on in Florida. And there, there, no one, I think, wants to go into uh, into that, and so I think very likely there will be, you know, um, it's extremely likely whether it's this session or, you know, future that there'll be some statute that sets forth, you know, for purposes of, you know, this con you know, this provision of the Constitution, you know, your, you know, your discharge of your sentence means this. Okay. Um, and I think it's possible that, you know, it could, you know, that it could mean uh, different things for different, different uh, offenses as well. And what's the governor's position on including restitution and fines in that? The governor has uh, her, her, what she proposed um, was that uh, completing your sentence would be completing probation and parole, and that it would not include um, uh, restitution, that it shouldn't be any harder than it is, you know, under our current process, which, um, you know, permits as long as you're making progress towards paying, paying it, um, that she will restore uh, her right. That said, she's also, I mean, she wants to pass a constitutional amendment, and you, that's, there's a legislative process, and, you know, that's an issue that a lot of legislators are concerned about as well, you know, so I, I don't know, ultimately, um, what will come out of that process? I mean, I, ironically, although she's leading on this issue, she doesn't sign a constitutional amendment. It, you know, she doesn't really have a say you know, in the official process. I mean, she'll have one vote hopefully when it goes to the voters. Um, but uh, uh, we'll, you know, we're working very closely with the legislature to to see what we can do. Thank you. So I think I have a very simple question, not about the law or government or anything. How long is the process after filling out the app? How long does it take? It, re it varies. You know, our, our hope was uh, 30 days uh, was, our, was, our, was our goal. We have not been meeting that, you know, with the overwhelming... Um, yeah, uh, I know. Yeah, the <laughs> uh, with, with, with the overwhelming uh, interest. Um, yeah, so uh, I checked the box that said I was a federal inmate. Um, from here, conviction here in Iowa. I sent it in. I waited four weeks for someone to send it back to me. I also went online, sent a message to the governor's office. A lovely person named Megan Hall. Yes. She contacted me. She said, hey, we lost it. We can't find it. 
So uh, I refilled it out, sent it back to her. Actually, I scanned it and emailed it to her. You know, now I have her email address. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I got it back to her and everything. And she said that she emailed me back saying I'll be notified by the mail. And I did get something in the mail saying that the governor has it. That was uh, August 19th. So I didn't know if it takes longer for federal in Maine. No, it, 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 you know, it, we are, uh, you know, it's first in, first out, um, you know, it, but it, and um, I, with the except, if occasionally, if there is a more complicated thing, I guess, you know, individually, you know, someone can get slowed down a little bit, but um, let's talk. Sure. Yeah. Let's, uh, That's what I was going to say. Do I have to do what Dorn Walker did? And <laughs> contact the newspapers because the ACLU of Iowa is always looking for stories that That's we can great. elevate. That's great. And it's happened. It's worked in the past. So I have a story for you. Really, I, I, I do. I think you do. But, um, but we'd be happy to hear your story. And we, this is part of our public education role. So. Yeah. So, yeah. I've, I've, all my fines are paid up. I was released from supervised release 14 months early. I work with Inside Out, reentry, <laughs> case manager there, you know. And I do pay taxes. I definitely pay taxes. There's one thing that I'd like to say. I never voted before, but I'm not that same person that was convicted. So I do want to vote. Maybe you can help me with that. Okay. Um, a, a very spirited um, discussion and thank you all and and the panel especially thank you all for uh, your participation um, Doran's story reminds us that people in Des Moines read the paper and pay attention to phone calls <laughs> so if you want to be involved in this effort to make sure that our criminal justice system uh, it functions in a more just way in, in in this particular instance, uh, please make your voice heard and please buy a t-shirt when you leave. Yes, thank you. Thank you to this incredible panel. Let's give it up for them for coming and answering, I know, some very spirited uh, questions. And, and like John said, we want to thank you all for coming today. Um, you know, we know as we're talking, this bill is still in place. So please talk to your legislators. They are the ones that are going to be moving it forward. It's still moving, so make some phone calls, write some letters, you know, get your picture in the paper, talk to the ACLU, whatever you got to do. Let's make sure that this passes. And and like John said, you know, buy a T-shirt, um, volunteer. Uh, there's tons of work to be done around with reentry. So I'm so excited to see so many people here today, listening and engaging in these important conversations. And um, hope you all have a fabulous evening. Thank you.